Hello, good morning from a boulder overhang in Larimer County, Colorado. I haven't had a computer in a while that's working, and I got a nice comment from Amos Adams on my Jasper Punch 3 flint napping video I made, I guess, a month ago or so. And I thought it would be easier to do a short video because it was some really good questions, and instead of typing out a long response. So Amos writes, Marty, I have a few questions for you as a fairly green horn abo napper, four years napping. I should mention that I am a purist abo napper like yourself. And I'll just add right there that I do a lot of traditional flint napping using different tools than I have since, you know, I was a kid. Um, but some of the napping I do is probably not traditional just because I've, I might overuse some certain tools for expedience, especially when I've been at times a commercial flint napper. And so attention to replication, albeit I'm using traditional tools, doesn't exclude me from making bogus reproductions. And so it's just, I could go into that at length, but I'll just leave that there. As well as the use of a small copper uh, indirect percussion tool that I use occasionally for some notching on pseudo replicas that are heat treated. That Because the notching is just, is, is one thing that, one, if you're making replicas with, um, heat treated materials that are supposed to be raw and get a certain look it's it's more difficult to do actually with traditional tools and so sometimes for expediency I'll do that so just as, as a disclaimer um, but I do spend almost all of my time trying to do um, try to learn and grow and do traditional napping as uh, my journey in epo napping progresses and it's just never ending it's just like a it's like a bottomless pit of what, what am I doing right what am I doing wrong what can I learn and sometimes when you try to drive, figure out that you've got a traditional tool, you can apply it to projects that, that maybe it overextends its use. I did that a lot with the small vertical punches. Before I got into some horizontal punching, I still use vertical punches a lot, but I, would, I got good at holding down wider preforms than I could have using inward force and rapid blows and trying to maybe use that tool in ways that I was overextending it. So in some ways you can, you can get proficient at napping that's not realistic and then try to overextend it towards projects and so that's something to be aware of for, for any you know traditional foot napper. So he says, how often do you nap a week? His first question. Um, I started I started beating on around on rocks when I was about 15. I was uh, lucky enough that my family moved from Colorado to uh, West St. Louis County and there's a whole lot of Burlington shirt in the creeks and I got into looking for arrowheads with a friend of mine and started banging around on you know just with other rocks and had no idea what I was doing and then I went to a field school at the Campsville Center for American Archaeology dug at the twin ditch site with Toby Morrow and he was the archaeologist and he had a very competent flint napper and so I sat and watched and learned a lot from him got a, my first moose antler came home and then I started napping every day so I napped every day, went off and on. I'd, I'd go with breaks where I didn't nap, but I napped, uh, there was years where I napped more than I do now, and I, you know, just have more success now, and I try to be more methodical. So I don't know if it's hours or number of points, but these days I nap probably four to seven days a week. Uh, it took a couple weeks off um, last month, and then I smashed my finger about six months ago. I couldn't nap for about three months, so I did that uh, lay in rock, though, not napping. I've not really incurred any serious napping injuries, and that'll get to a question later that he asks. But I nap fairly regularly. But I must say that the years that I was learning, I was napping too much. When I was churning out lots of stuff, and um, one thing about hanging around a lot of modern nappers is that they, we tend to work a lot of huge rocks and make stylistic giant versions of prehistoric replicas to try to idealize and you know make the biggest and the best or the thinnest or whatever so that drove my napping probably and I was doing too much napping and you can kind of get sloppy with some techniques and in, in order to just to churn a lot of stuff so I eventually got over that too but um, I was doing too much napping and then you can do that you can you can chip yourself into you know, getting fatigued in certain aspects and then maybe you're doing more pressure flaking because your percussion, you're doing too much of it so you feel like you're not accurate so then you start doing tons of pressure flaking and before you know it, you're 
you're over taxing yourself. Second question, does the bison horn pressure flaker produce different flake scars as opposed to moose or deer antler pressure flakers? Also, is it harder than deer or moose antlers? Um, the bison horns, and I use um, buffalo, you know, just bison, bison. There's extinct forms of bison that were probably utilized by the Paleo Indian people, bison occidentalitis and antiquis. And so I'll get these water buffalo horns and use them as well. So there's different forms of, and you can use goat, goat horn, you know, cow horn. One thing I want to do is use antelope horns, which I've never done yet. That's probably a good one. Mountain sheep horn. Um, there's actually a, a flint napping toolkit that was found in a dry shelter out west that had, it's a prairie dog skin bag that had um, shaped small pieces of um, mountain sheep horn that were used as vertical punches and they had an embedded flake fragments and things like that in them. So using the horn for punching and pressure is different and sometimes with pressure, um, if it's pressure is applied too heavy, the, it, the, it, the laminated hairs of the horn can split off. And so if that happens, like in this case, a, a sliver came off from punching a piece of rhyolite that I should, I should never have tried to do with the horn. But anyway, you can save these and use these for sort of micro flakers and, and just sort of try to keep a clean spot on there and just rock into the e and lean edges if there's just very light abrading and do some really neat oblique um, flaking. And you can do some heavier pressure flaking, inserting cut sections of antler into other handles like this. This one's worn down really short, but that's effective. It's important to to use it in the way where it's in, it's less likely to split. The horn is sort of lays flat, so it'll split both ways. But it's one way it'll split when it's thinner, a little easier. So I try to I try to keep it stronger and keep an eye on it. And if it starts to wear a divot, just file that out. It just takes a second on a piece of sandstone to keep it going. But they're actually softer, and but hardness and softness in relating to steel flakers and copper flakers is easier to describe because people are using pointed tools and you can readily see that the copper tip is flexing or that the pressure on a small point is applying a different kind of cone and with organic or with um, antler and bone flakers you can use broader tips you can use finer tips too but you can use a, a wide variety of tips so you're grabbing in ways where the antler and sometimes when it's a fresh tine a lot of people will take a a deer rack and they'll just cut a tine off and instantly start pressure flaking it well the outer areas of some and antlers highly variable but the outer areas can sometimes want to flake off so if you scuff it off and scuff it up and get it going and then work down into the off the tine just a little bit you can get a more consistent um, antler and then you can you can do some some different kind of work with it where it holds up better. Then you can know when you can apply more force without splitting the tool, or you can work away from the marrow and do things like that. So traditional napping is, and, and just rating it hard to soft, it's one, it's, it's more highly variable than the, the metal tools. And there's different widths and, and shapes of flakers that you can use to affect. So, but generally the bison is softer. You can uh, create longer flakes. You can use more soft leather support and create ridges and do really nice slow load um, long flakes off of ridges where a harder tool wouldn't push the flake that far. It's just really building up a slow pressure and then releasing a flake um, so you can do some really fun small oblique work with the, the softer uh, bison horn. We're at nine minutes already, geez. Okay. Question three, did the old boys use antler punches similar to yours in this video with the drilled base on a stick? That's this, this is the, the shaft punch, this is a white-tailed deer insert. Um, you can use finer tips, you can use broader tips, you can use bone, you can put horn on there, whatever. It's important with these to have the end seated not on something hard where it will kick, um, but wedged in some mud or dirt and then get the right flex on it to where it's not it's got maybe a teeny bit of movement this way but you can get some inward as well and there's some flex in this too um yes i've seen uh a few years ago i went and did some archaeology uh, work in florida and we got to visit a private collection that was amassed from finds um mostly around gainesville and but there's some antler flakers that I believe came out of the Swanee River in 
they were well preserved. And they were sections of antler much like this. Some of them were bigger diameter, some of them were a little bit longer. They were drilled in the end, and they, when they were worn down to the, to the pith, some of them even were re-drilled and had little bone inserts put in the end, where they were using those as little punches. And they were in a glass case. They, they were flat, and the lighting was horrible, and my pictures didn't turn out. But they were, I don't think they've ever been described. They are pretty amazing. So, yeah. Um, if I had, I don't know if it would have been better or worse if I would have seen those first and then made my tools to look like that. I guess it wouldn't really matter. But it's nice when you are doing experimental napping and you wear your tools down and you're just you're just making something that you think would work and then you end up seeing that somewhere. And it's a, to me it gives more credence than scouring the ethnographic reports for examples of poorly described um, traditional foot napping by the Native Americans and then trying to extrapolate or interpret what the witness saw and things like that because you can use a tool this you know the the wear of the tools will, will tell you how it's used and um, it's pretty if you can find them after you develop yours then it's I think it gives a, a you know good credibility that that's how they were done and my little stone anvil stones I've seen those too there's been numerous times where I've seen um, in the record napping tools that match my own and that's what makes this the most fun so um, yes, I did see some punches just like that that were drilled. Although I think it would be pretty easy just to ship left mate and tie or, you know, other methods of doing it without drilling. Although, keep in mind that if you are going to cut and score antler, it's fairly easy to do. Most billets that are found, there have been a few, mostly I guess the probably woodland burials have had some antler billets. And they're generally pretty short, not, not any of them are very long. And some of them actually may have been tied on to some of the flat wear. Um, and sometimes you can even see like a worn out spot in the, in the base where they could have stuck something in there and tied it on. So some billets may be interpreted, misinterpreted as punches. I'm not trying to sell the punch thing all the way. You know, in every instance there's obviously correct percussion going on, but um, that might be a case too. And so the marrow though, it's pretty easy to uh, score and snap an antler, and then it's not that hard to drill it because it'll have some some pith down the beam, right? So elk has got tons of it. Whitetail has enough to wear uh, with a simple stone drill, and you know, getting this in something, you know, you could, you know, it, you could you could drill that out pretty easily. So, but that was the only instance that, that I saw those was in that uh, the Ikrami collection, and which is not going to be part of an. Uh, he donated to a larger museum, so maybe those will be on display, and hopefully I can get some uh, pictures of those at some point. Um, how do I nap so I don't develop arthritis or joint issues 20 years from now? I'm 29 years old and want to take care of my body so I can nap for as long as I can. So that's a good question, too. Um, I think that a diversity of napping styles can help you out. There's some people that do a lot of pressure flaking the same way. And like carpal tunnel, as if you're a mechanic or you're wrenching or you're doing things and you're gripping and you're doing the same repetitive motion over and over again. If you're doing a whole lot of napping and you're doing it the same way, then you can develop imbalance. If you're using tons of direct percussion on big rocks, you know, your right side and your back is going to get, you know, some strain. Or if you're doing a lot of pressure flaking one way, that's going to, you know, really affect your wrist. So I would say just mix it up and don't overdo the antler pressure flaking with small flakers because that can, um, or if you do, like sometimes I'll work on my knee and that's different than, you know, if I'm working between the knees. So just kind of mix it up and try to keep your body balanced. You know, if you're, you can get too strong and then hurt yourself, you know, you can, if you're, you know, big bodybuilder guy and then you're, you've got all your muscles that are just weight muscles in the gym and then you do stuff with your fine, you know, twisting hand movements around your joints, you can, you can be too strong in certain areas and then think that you're tough and then do something and, you know, mess up some small little muscles. So just, you know, core body, if you're, you know, if you do some sit-ups so that you're, you know, not relying on your, your back too much, sort of keep yourself balanced and and uh, then just don't do overdo it. That's what I would say. The, the damage that I've got on my elbow is cracky and creaky, and that's from swinging four pound 
hammers on carbide chisels on hard stone and the concussion just goes right to your elbow so I don't I don't do as much of that anymore so um, just you know keep at it gra gradually and pay attention to your body and um, you know you're gonna get a crooked finger and you're gonna have little aches and pains and a few cuts but I guess just you know life is dangerous so just kind of try to mix it up and give yourself a rest when you need it and glucose I mean you can take some supplements but I'm not gonna so that just, I'm gonna try to stay healthy. Um, yeah, I use hammer stones and direct percussion as much as possible when setting up platforms similar to how you do. I avoid pressure liking as much as possible because of the strain it causes. That's probably good. But keep in mind that you can also set up edges to where, like when I'm making a Sloan Dalton and I'm finishing my last four sets with pressure, there's no way around it on certain widths and certain kinds of material where it's just get everything right and then strain, but try to only strain on those, you know, hundred flakes and and hopefully if everything, if the edges are right, then you can learn that you can really put on some really heavy pressure and then release and you can kind of get in a rhythm where it's not like you're doing that on the whole preform, so. Um, I appreciate if you take the time to answer my questions. You're welcome. Thank you very for the very good questions. It means a lot. As I am self-taught through years and other videos, keep up the good work. And thanks heck of a lot for sharing your knowledge. I love watching you nap and learn so much from me. All right, I really appreciate it. So, is there anything I missed? Um, I appreciate that people like my videos considering so much of the, what I really need is a camera over here to look down to show some of the pressure flaking that I'm doing and other techniques. I would ex um, encourage other people to experiment with some of the things that I do and also try to branch out and do some different things. The most underused um, and plausible techniques that I think happened a lot in certain um, time periods and areas is the use of probably stone punches, small stone punches that were inserted in things. So it's just gonna be stone punch over hammer stone and, it, that, and little that I've done with it shows a lot of promise. So. I'd encourage people to think outside the box and to try to expand the traditional toolkits and then maybe with some cooperation and collaboration we can, you know, parse those out of the archaeological record and maybe get somewhere. And also, which I am doing some and, and should do more, is save some of the flakes if you're doing some experimental work. If I save my buffalo punch flakes and then line them up next to my ivory punch flakes, if I'm making a Midland or a Western Clovis, I can tell that the platforms have different signatures. And so some of the archaeological evidence that can be um, found where there's not diagnostics, like finished or broken points, some of these campsites that are single component, we might be able to parse out some of the um, variation in what they're using and then maybe use that to identify some cultural periods. I mean, that's you know, big thinking, but it's possible. A, a sample of nappers that are comparing their results and saving their flakes is going to it's just cause it's just physics, right? And it's just a material that you're breaking. So some of the stuff we're gonna be able to figure out whether it's wood or anything like that. So that's really all I can think of right now. You can see the neat little shelter that I've got over me right now. There's some cliff swallow nests and things like that. There's a nice little river out there. So anyhow, Thanks, Amos, for the good questions, and all right, have a good one.